And we're live for the Frugal Health Podcast. I'm glad to be here tonight, today, and afternoon. I don't know what time you're watching this, but I'm more than glad to be able not to just introduce, but to interview my main influence into natural hygiene, into a frugivore, a raw food diet, and to health in general. He was the guy actually that uh, changed my life forever. I just said him and I, see, I say it again. I see him, him as a second father for me because he actually gave me life. A better life than actually my, I love you, my mom and dad, but a better life than you guys actually gave me because being a raw fooder, being a, a, a frugivore, understanding natural hygiene and that I have to understand that I have to take care of my own health by my own means, by my own self, it changed the whole life forever and it's So it has been 17 years without any day of sickness, without a short roll, without a, a foggy brain, without uh, every day you, you are productive, you are healthy, you are vibrant, you are better than you ever were before. So how not to love this guy for actually putting the word out there in, in, into the world that nobody put it like it before. We knew about being a frugivore for 200 years in natural hygiene, but Doug had created actually the model, the system, the book that influenced it and uh, it made it a lot more simple to understand the path to follow. So since I started like watching his content, seeing his videos, website and forum back then, I I wanted to be like him. So I started exercising every day. I started like focusing a lot on my health. My girlfriend back then said that Dr. Douglas Grant actually broke our relationship. She, he was the cause for us to breaking up. But because I was talking about the guy every single day, every single hour, but it changed my life. So I'm very proud to present the creator, uh, the author of the 80-10 diet, the 80-10-10 diet, and my main mentor, my main influence, Dr. Douglas Grant. Without taking any kind of effort to introduce yourself, please uh, introduce that's, that's yourself. That's really right. powerful words, Eduardo. I'm honored. I'm, I'm, I'm moved, and, and I'm super, super glad that You chose to spend a month with me down in Costa Rica and study seriously. Uh, it obviously had the desired effect because you went home a changed man and took your life into your own hands. You took responsibility. And, and to me, this is what hygiene is really about. It's making intelligent decisions when i when i describe the science of human health it's it's about making intelligent decisions or intelligent choices so that we can be more response able we're more able to respond so when i am around someone who's smoking At the very first whiff of cigarette smoke, I move so as not to be inhaling more smoke because I respond to the, and somebody else might say, oh, I didn't even notice the smoke. Um, or sounds I don't like or places that make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, we become more response able We become more responsible. And, and this response ability is an indicator of our own vitality. So I'm glad that you took responsibility. I know that your serious um, situation, you've told your story before, your life was... Your life was really at a crossroads. You had the option to keep doing what you were doing and and just watch your health go quickly downhill or change a be lot of now. things, totally overhaul the way you lived 
um, into a situation that was much more responsible where you said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not only in charge of my own health, but I'm the one who's going to suffer the consequences or the benefits. And I'm thrilled to see 17 years later, you know, you've grown into a, a successful, healthy, fit individual, you know, who's having fun every single day, planting trees and, and picking fruit and influencing thousands and thousands of people. And I bless you for that because that was the mission in, in my mind. As I told you back then and tell you again today, my mind, I'm, I'm growing the movement. I'm creating more teachers. And yes, I still love coaching individuals, but it's tremendously rewarding to me when I can coach the coaches. So it's an honor again, as I say, I'm thrilled to be here and anything you'd like to ask, I'm happy to give you my best input. It's an honor to me as well. And like, I would be dead by now if I haven't changed. And I knew that, but nobody can, nobody uh, actually understands us, right? They think that we are like, ah, you just have a, a sore throat once in a while. We're not that sick. That's not, they, we are visionaries. That's what I think. We're the biggest health visionaries everybody that understands hygiene is the biggest visionaries in the in the history of medicine so like i just have to congratulate you and thank you because we are all, all, oftentimes misunderstood right uh or underestimated for our efforts and for our beliefs that we can change the world with hygiene so you you gave me a life so i uh, i decided to make my life to give others life as well. So that was my main goal. And for sure, uh, not just learning with you in Costa Rica, but learning with you through all those years, like uh, from books, from indications to read Herbert Shelton, from reading the Veg Source Forum. I read all of your posts for like 10 years because I knew if I want something, that was the right guy to go for. And I'm still with the same confidence, uh, like uh, 10, uh, 17 years afterwards, that everybody that asked me, like, can I have an indication of uh, some other health professional that lives nearby me or etc.? I say, like, I have a lot of professionals maybe I can indicate, but besides me, I have only one that I can truly indicate that with my eyes closed, I would say in Portuguese, it would be Dr. Douglas Grin. Because, yeah, you, you seen things better than everybody, in my humble opinion. So, like, uh, and you were ahead of your time. So, I started intermittent fasting because of you 17 years ago. There was no, not even the coined word intermittent fasting. So, we have all more belongings. Um, tell me more about what you actually created, the 80-10-10 diet, right? Why that would be the per perfect diet for humans, for example? It's a funny story, actually. And maybe you know it, but maybe not. Uh, when, I was, when I was in college, I used to play football with a couple of guys that lived in my dormitory. We, our football, American football. Uh, basically, we'd throw the ball back and forth and just have fun playing catch. And we decided, we decided at one point that we weren't throwing a ball back and forth. We were conveying a thought. And we really wanted the other person to catch the thought that we were trying to convey. And so when we threw the ball, we didn't just throw it and hope that he'd get it. We'd throw it in a way that we really wanted him to be able to get it. And I know this is just a story, um, but it, it ended up being that when I got the opportunities to go out on stage, I, I felt the same feeling that I wanted people to get what I was giving. By the way, when we did play catch that way, we tended to catch the ball more often than 
when we just threw the ball back and forth because we really wanted to understand each other, you know, and, and we thought, and we called it thought football. But um, when I go on stage and I want people to understand what I'm talking about, I have to think, you know, how can I get this across in a way that it's going to be meaningful to people? Uh, how can I say this in a way that that they'll take it to heart, that they'll remember it, that it'll mean something that they'll really grasp. So what we came up with back then was college is a waste of time and getting a job is going to be horrible and it's just going to be a 40 years of work with no end in sight and then you retire and die and and, and it just didn't sound like anything that the three or four of us that were playing ball really wanted to do. And we decided back then that the thing to do was buy an island and go live on it. And, and we could go, you know, into our own little world and create our own little world on the island. And it sounded great in every way, except none of us had any money to buy anything. And so we kind of hit up, we kind of hit a snag and the island never got bought. Well, I worked for five years after college before I went back to school. And during those five years is when my health awareness really started taking off. It was all through the 70s. And bit by bit by bit, things started to fall away as rejected non-viable options. I tried macro neurotic, I tried vegetarian, I tried the vegan, I tried just improving my diet a little bit here and there, I tried different fitness programs, I, I tried a lot of things. I was really looking and didn't know what I was looking for. And when I went back to school to get my medical degree, I talked to a lot of people in the first year. I mean, we're really trying to meet each other and find out who's who and get ideas. And, and I talked to a lot of people and told them that my idea still was an island where people would come. And because you're on an island, they, they've run out of options. So they're going to eat what we give them. And they're going to do what we tell them because it's, it's, uh, elective whether they come or not they're not being forced on the island and on this island it's going to be like a health island and we're going to get people active physically active we're going to play we're going to have fun we're going to throw ourselves into games like kids do with full enthusiasm play our heart out as they say put your heart into it and and we'd eat Whatever we grew, there was going to be fruits, there was going to be vegetables, it was going to be tropical, it was going to be lovely. Um, and my, my theory, with nobody to ask, was if these people came, and it didn't matter what health condition they came with, would they go home healthy? Or would they get healthier while they were there? And it was my contention that they would, that they'd get healthier if they just slept enough and were active and ate fruits and vegetables. And that was that. And we didn't really have to intervene. I didn't have to do therapies. I didn't have to use modalities. I didn't have to use medicines. I didn't have to use drugs. I didn't have to use... Uh, more invasive techniques. I didn't have to do serious testing. I didn't have to do, you know, expensive anythings. I could just like say, you know what? Just like basically back to nature. Basically just back to nature. Uh, get some sunshine, get some fresh air, have some fun with people, eat some fruits and vegetables be active. There really wasn't much more to it. It seemed in some ways overly simplistic. And I, and I got the same answer from three or four guys. They said, you should talk to Dr. Sabatino. He did that. 
So I found Dr. Sabatino, who was teaching at the school maybe one day a week or something while he was getting his own PhD at a, I think at Emory University, which was downtown Atlanta. And and I went up to Dr. Sabatino. Well, I'm a student, so I'm a first year student. I'm uh, I'm pretty awed by somebody who's already a doctor and who's already done what I want to find out about. So I went up to him and I said, uh, excuse me, Dr. Sabatino, I'm wondering if you could answer some questions. And he goes, what do you want to know? I said, well, it might be a whole conversation. Uh, what I'd love to do is take you out to lunch one day and we could just sit and talk in private. And he said, fine, I'll go to lunch with you. There's a local place, serve salads. So I took him out to lunch. He was I don't know, a couple days later, we went out to lunch and, and he said, what can I do? And I said, well, here's my theory. Uh, you know, we take people, put them on an island. Would they get better from practically everything if we just did what I've already described? And he said, you're talking about natural hygiene. I go, if you say so, but I've never heard of that before, what is it? And he said, well, you know, it's the science of human health. And you can read all about it if you read this guy, Dr. Herbert Shelton. Well, he only wrote 40 books, so I read them. And, and uh, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm an avid reader. You know I'm an avid reader. So I read his books. I, I literally sucked up his books. His books were like, oh my God, this is like fresh air. If there ever was, you never had such a breath of fresh air, right? This guy was, and I got to a I point. I felt that with anything then. And I got to a point where I could, I knew him well enough. I felt like I'd never met him, uh, but I felt like I knew him well enough that I could even tell when he was being tongue in cheek and, and having fun with his writing being a little facetious and stuff um, because he wasn't always just dead serious. And, and, uh, and I read his stuff. I don't know if you know the concept of, of medical school, but basically you're paying people to brainwash you into becoming a doctor. You're paying people to brainwash you to think like a doctor. And, and they use brainwashing technique, which is, you know, there's only two parts to brainwashing. There's sleep deprivation and take you away from your immediate family, your peer group. So by going away to school and then experiencing massive years of sleep deprivation as I'm going through school, I'm opening myself up to the message, which is to learn to think like a doctor. Yeah, I took all the coursework, of course, and I took every nutrition course offered and studied not just Shelton, but everybody else that Shelton quoted. If he mentioned a name, I read their book, whether it's Tilden and Trawl and all the old timers that went before him and all the people who who were writing books in the early 1900s and on and on through the whole thing. Uh, the, the people who didn't even know that what they were saying was hygiene, but it eventually kind of like was on the same, same page, uh, you know, and there's seventh day at Venice writings and there's just all kinds of writings of people by people who, who created this concept, uh, what was at first known as nature cure. And the doctors, the medical establishment, they made fun of it. And they said, we'll call it the do nothing cure because there's no drugs, there's no surgery. So they, they started making fun of it in the papers and cartoons and stuff. They called it the do nothing cure. Well, the hygiene doctors responded because they too were doctors. And so they responded and they said, well, we only do nothing when nothing is what's called for. So it's the doing nothing intelligently cure. 
So I like the, the intelligent part of knowing when to intervene and when to let nature take its course because we understand that if you cut your finger, it's going to heal itself. We have no doubt in our mind this is going to heal. And if you cut off the very tip of your finger, it'll grow back. And we have no doubt in our mind if a bug bites us or we bump into something that it's going to heal. It's almost obvious how built in the idea that our bodies are self-healing really is. And we, eat, season, right? we eat food and it's somehow the usable parts turn into us and the unusable parts we flush away. Um, we grow from small to big. We, we learn constantly. Constantly. We're either learning what we want to learn or we're learning other stuff. But we're always learning. Can't help it. Uh, can you imagine if you had to pump your own blood to 100 trillion cells? I mean, your body's taking care of a lot of things for you. You couldn't, you know more than most people about how food digests, but I challenge you to digest anything on your own to choreograph that whole series of events. It's not going to be as well, it's not going to be done as well as your body does it. You know, let alone how to learn something, how to, how to add myelin to your nerves that you're using to the specific tracks of your nerves that you're using to learn how to walk on a slack line or something, or, you know, how to do a handstand. When I was in school, I had to describe some kind of a movement for a kinesiology project. And and I took the simplest thing I could possibly think of, which was just a handstand. I couldn't get to the end of the project. It was just endless. There was so much involved in just standing there. It wouldn't have mattered if you were on your feet or your hands, but I chose hands. I was a gymnast and, and, uh, and it just, the considerations were just endless. It was amazing how much was going on. So in the body, 100 trillion cells doing several thousand things each every second. I mean, the numbers are beyond our imagination by far. And, and, and I just got very excited by this whole hygiene thing. And I, and, and, and I realized that I touched the tip of an iceberg and that I was a, wow, was I ever a beginner? And that I wanted to respect all the people who'd gone before me because they knew so much and I knew so little. And I sat at the feet of mentors like Alec Burton and Keki Sidwa and Frank Sabatino and Ralph Sinquet and, and Dr. Benish and Dr. Doctors Martin and, and so many, um, of the hygiene greats that were here I was in my 30s and, and they were in their 70s and most of them and I'm sitting there going wow he Vitru, 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 probably also right. Dr. Vitrano and and the first time I met Dr. Vitrano I'm like oh my god I'm sitting at the feet of a god you know or a goddess and 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 we talked a little bit and eventually I said like what's your strength what's your strongest strength and she said cellular physiology and I said, wow, you know, that's my strongest strength, too, is cellular physiology. I mean, that's the thing that interests me most. She And we made friends right there, you know. And then from, from then for the next 20 years of her life, uh, almost 25 years of her life, like we just stayed friends and stayed in touch. And I could ask her questions and she, uh, she helped me in many ways. But... I just realized like I was on to something magnificent and like you, I stuck with it. I just stuck with it, Eduardo. I just stuck with it. And the next thing you know, I'm describing to people about what happens when you eat fruits and vegetables and good things happen. 
and I'm running a health retreat and people are coming and I'm giving them fruits and vegetables and they're getting well. And uh, wouldn't you know, out of the blue, something happened that I totally didn't see coming. Uh, it was called the Internet. And the Internet happened. And, and people started finding out about things that they'd never been able to find out about before. And a movement began that had been crushed a hundred years prior. The movement was called the raw food movement. Now, a hundred years prior, there was a raw food movement in the States and in Europe, and I'm sure elsewhere. And it was a big movement. It was sometimes called nature cure. It was sometimes had other names associated with it, but it was the, it was the raw food movement. And there were, thousands and thousands of people. There was 5,000 people in a city of Chicago that only had 50,000 people. And 5,000 of them were part of this raw food group. And the medical establishment successfully squashed the raw food movement back in the early 1900s by promoting a concept that's never been proven uh, called germs, germ theory which to this day is still a theory, not a fact, that germs cause disease. We're not questioning whether bacteria exist. It's are they the course, are they the cause of disease or are we making our own disease? So the raw food movement disappeared, but now 100 years later, it pops back up. And the next thing I know, there's festivals and there's teachers and there's people teaching raw foods. And somebody heard about me, and I'm being invited to raw food festivals. And it was kind of cool, except what they were doing and what I was doing was two different things. They were doing stimulants and irritants and supplements and condiments, and as long as it's raw, it's fine. And it was the high, it was nuts and seeds and salt, basically. Nuts and seeds and salt and, and chocolate, maybe. Or, it was just... It was ridiculous. I'm eating fruits and vegetables. They're eating nuts and seeds and salt. I mean, it was it was so far from what I was doing. And yet they go, wow, you've been on a raw food diet for 15 years. You've been on a raw food diet for 20 years. We need you to come to our festival. We're, you're going to give it credibility. You're going to give it this and that. And, and a bunch of the other presenters said, we don't want Dr. Graham. He's killing our business. He's just killing it. Like from the stage, he's he's shutting us down. You know, we don't want that voice. And the event organizers got stuck in a in a bind. And some of them blackballed me, but some of them didn't. And it was interesting, though, Eduardo, because I predicted that this was unsustainable. That the that what was being presented in the late '90s and the early what are called naughties, um, was an unsustainable raw food program. And every one of those raw food leaders proved that it was, in fact, unsustainable by either dropping out of the raw food movement, dropping completely out of the vegan movement, uh, changing their program again and again and again, looking for something that would work, the latest supplement, the latest whatever, uh, but most of them disappeared completely, and you no longer hear about most of them. Some of them have resurfaced back into the raw food. Well, anyway, eventually there was there was seven festivals happening around the world. There was lots of, of interest in raw food, and then it all just crashed. By 2005, it was pretty much over and done. I'd spent five years by then writing 801010, which was my rebuttal to this raw food movement of high fat stimulants, condiments, irritants, etc. And in and it finally published 801010, which was just a chance for me partly to give my rebuttal to what was the raw food movement of the day, uh, but also to express from my heart what I had felt all the way since those college days when I go, wow, you know, if people just ate fruits and vegetables and they were active and they lived a healthy lifestyle, 
Seems like health should happen. I mean, that's what we do to plants. We just give them what they need and then strong, healthy plants happen. And, and when, we, when we care for animals, we give them what they need and strong, healthy animals develop and, and just seems like, and that's how nature does it. I mean, you don't see polar bears living on the equator and you don't see alligators living in the Arctic. Uh, they're going where nature gives them everything they need to survive and then they thrive. So I just said, let's apply that to human beings. And I described it in 801010, as you well know, and, and did my best to come up with the rationale of saying, look, you know, we, we don't have claws, we don't have fangs, we don't have speed, um, we're, we're squeamish about blood. Um, if we tried to if we tried to catch a squirrel, the squirrel would scratch us and bite us and probably we'd get infections and die. Uh, we're really not very good at hunting. We're not equipped to hunt. Uh, we don't have multiple teats. We don't get around on four legs. We, we just don't have any of the, the signs and, of, of being hunters. And, and, and yet all of history, all of the, all the people who study ancient man tell us that they ate a lot of fruit. They collected a lot of leaves. They, the teeth, everything about us supports the idea that we were frugivore, as you said, primarily eating fruit. Granted, you ate whatever you had to in order to survive. You might eat the bark off of trees one, one very lean winter. You know? You're know, you going to try practically everything if you get hungry enough. But when there's plenty of fruit, darn it, fruit becomes the food of choice. Yeah, when the fruit's good, it's the food of choice. I had white nectarines today that were so good that I really, I mean, I was planning on having bananas for lunch. The white nectarines were so good that I didn't even think about bananas. I just wanted more white nectarine. They were so good. When the fruit's popping, that's what you have. So it became my choice. And, and all the way through school, I learned that fruits and vegetables are good for you. And at one point, I finally said, gee, I wonder what would happen if I ate fruits and vegetables to the exclusion of everything else. And everybody said, oh, that would be a bad idea, Doug. Which left me knowing I was on to something. <laughs> Had to try it. <laughs> and, I, and there was nobody to try it on except myself. So I tried it on myself. Gee, I wonder what would happen if the only thing I ate was fruits and vegetables to the exclusion of everything else. Which led me to a lot of failures. And I went through the failures because once I caught on to the idea, I couldn't really let it go. I go, okay, I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I added in more fruit, realized I was going back to starches, added in more fruit, realized I was occasionally being driven to eat more nuts and seeds, added in more fruit. And every time I added in more fruit, I mean, it became like a mantra almost, you know, eat more fruit. Um, and darn if my mom wasn't right when I was six years old. And she said, you know, if you eat sweets before your meal, it'll spoil your appetite. She was absolutely correct. That's why we eat is to spoil our appetite, to satisfy ourselves. And fruits do it better than anything else. They satisfy us. They satiate us. Anybody who's ever eaten out in a restaurant ever in their life knows that this is the case, which is why we save desserts for last in restaurants, because the meal didn't satisfy you, but you have room for dessert. You eat a little bit of dessert, and then you're satisfied. Probably at home you did the same thing. And I just go, gee, I wonder what would happen if I just had dessert for a meal. Let me just have sweet and juicy fruit. Let's make a meal of it. It wasn't that profound, except when I looked back, I realized what I'd done, which was exactly what all the vegan health doctors were saying. Eat a low-fat vegan diet. And then I looked at what do the animals built like us eat and the orangutan, and the chimpanzee, and the gorilla, and the bonobo, and the, you know, all of these guys, and, and it turns out they eat a, a low-fat 
diet that's predominated by fruit and veg. And then I looked at what are the long-lived people on the planet eat. And they eat a low-fat diet that's predominated by plants. And then I looked at what do all the top performing athletes eat in the endurance sports, in the ultra sports, in, in performance sports, uh, with a few exceptions in, in where it's mass, mass against an object like shot putters or something. Um, but almost all other aspects of sport, people are eating a diet that's dominated by carbohydrates. So I just go, gee, let's apply that to fruits and vegetables. Let's dominate the diet with carbohydrate. What does this come out looking like? It looks like everybody in the world eats between 9 and 11% protein. So let's just call the protein 10. And we're going to go to, if I eat a diet of just fruits and vegetables, how much fat is there? Well, it comes out usually around 7 or 8 or 9% of my calories come from fat. So let's just call it 10 and what I'm looking to do is I want my diet to be predominated by carbohydrate. I want more than 80% of my calories to come from carbohydrate, which left me at 80, 10, 10. I'm looking for more than 80% of my calories to come from the simple carbohydrates we call glucose and fructose. Why? Because they require the least effort in order to absorb them directly into the bloodstream. They don't even require digestive effort. They're just absorbed right into the bloodstream, right to the muscles, right to the organs, right to the cells as glucose and fructose. It's an effortless process, which is a beautiful thing. It makes for super fast recovery for sport. It makes for ease of digestion, meaning there's more energy. You know, most people use more than a third of their energy to digest their food. All of a sudden, when we're not having to do that, and we save 15, 20, 25% on the digestive effort of converting complex carbohydrates into starches. I'm sorry, complex carbohydrates into simple ones. All of a sudden you go, wow, I have a sense of more energy than I used to have. I can do things now. I, I can get through my day. I, I have energy to spare. I can go play. I can move. I can go be active. Um, I can focus more. I'm not getting mentally tired so much. I'm, I mean, it, it was a good feeling. It was a really good feeling. Oh, I'm not getting sick, as Eduardo said. Years and decades start going by. I'm not getting sick. And people ask me about it, and I go, well, it's an experiment. How long have you been doing the experiment? Oh, maybe about 45 years now. Uh, talk to me in another 45 years. I'll tell you how the experiment's going to turn out. If you're alive. If the person is alive. Right? <laughs> it's working so, yeah, if they're alive, come back. You know, but it's working so well that I just keep working it. And that's how 801010 came about. I just, it took five years to write it down. I never would have done it if my dear wife, Rosie, hadn't said, Doug, you need to write this stuff down. You need to leave a legacy. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll write it down. But I don't want, I, writing books is terrible. You know, writing books is terrible. Autographing books is wonderful. But writing books is terrible. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks to you and Shelton, I'm about to publish my 10th book. So it, it, it's hard, but it's, it's a must, uh, it's a must do for yeah, for, for the must. next generations. I agree. It's a must. So you got to write it down. You got to put your thoughts to paper. Somehow it's, it's not as hard as it used to be. Can you imagine Shelton was writing with a manual typewriter? Whew. <laughs> that, it's unbelievable. 40 books like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Crossing, Crossing out, out words, words with... There was no autocorrect. There was no, no whiteout. They didn't have any. He was writing. I don't even know. The, the persistence had to be unbelievable. But it's easier now. But we also have the responsibility to follow through more. So let's follow through.
anyway, that's the story. That's how it came to be. And, and the rest is kind of history after that. 801010 10 came out. Um, I've met a bunch of people who've told me they've re- they wrote the book. Um, I go, that's interesting, you know, that you wrote the book. I already heard somebody in the Rolfo movement say that. Yeah. Um, that you saw his ideas. I, you know, I've heard that too. I, I've heard it several different ways. Um, but if you look at the book, you'll see my names on the, on the cover. And, <laughs> and I can tell you I wrote every single word, you know. I, I wrote every single word, so. We, we uh, know that. We know that, Doug. We, it, it's, it's been, it's it's been a fun ride. People. It's been a fun ride. It's really interesting now, the number, you know, there's, there's 100 people out there in the raw food movement nowadays um, who are teaching that were former students of mine. Um, I've got a I've got a student program going now, a coaches program. So we're certifying coaches, and and to me, this is the rewarding the rewarding phase that that now, out of all those festivals that used to happen, now there's fruit festivals, and you've been to some of them, and I, I know you're going to be hosting some of them. Um, now there's 80, 10, 10 festivals all around the world. Uh, there's, I think, six or seven. I to do the Brazilian one. I can't I wait to, to come. to do the Brazilian one one day and have you over to, to lecture. Well, you know, I'll call you on that. And first of all, say, I know you're a man of your word. And second of all, one day um, is very nebulous, very cloud-like like one day just doesn't do it give me a date in less than five years but i if, if, if i i can maybe in two or three years stops just let me grow the audience and manage to get people over here and i swear to god you you will be eating sapotes mangoes from out from out of my trees <laughs> i well, don't forward. manage to grow durian yet damn okay. it but my, dur- my durian trees in Costa Rica are 20 years old. They haven't fruited yet. The jackfruit's been fruiting for a decade, and the durian is still waiting. This is not a fruit really tree. That, this is not a fruit tree that gives early. But once it starts, it will give. But you got you got to put some time into them. Mine died. I don't know why. Maybe lack of water. I tried to water then, but you know. They do like tropical. But I, 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 yeah, I'm a subtropical, Rio de Janeiro is subtropical, right? Close to Rio right here. But like, I can grow a lot of other stuff. Chocolate sapote is growing well, you know, uh, mame is growing, uh, canistel. So I have a lot of stuff. So yeah. I, I don't complain. During one day, during. <laughs> so that, that's wonderful to hear that, that the, whole his, the whole story. I didn't, I know, I knew bits and pieces, but I didn't yeah. know the whole story. And I felt the same thing when I found you. I, I felt goosebumps. I, when I found your website on the day of my birthday in 2007, you published 81010 in 2006, December, right? Or November. November or something like that in the end of the November. Yeah, and I read it on February. I found you on the day of my birthday. And then I went out to have the last cook food dinner with my girlfriend, but I was already like eating raw for three months. So, so I was giving like me a gift that day, right? And I, I learned to not give me bad gifts. <laughs> and I felt goosebumps when I found your website. There was the, the guy like doing L sit-ups, you know, like uh, talking about anthropoid primates. I felt like this guy knows what, you know, I, 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 I have been exposed back then for a, a, through a lot of uh, raw food leaders. But I was like, that sounds like, you know, a crook, or, you know, like, uh, I, I don't want to code names, avocado guys and blah, blah, blah. And I, I knew by their faces and by their, what they were talking that it didn't make any sense. The raw food concept made sense. But when I found you, I knew I was onto something and I just bought the 801010 book. The minute I found you and when it got to my place, when, when the book arrived, I read the whole book in one sitting, in one day. I couldn't go up, I couldn't get up. I was just going pee and reading, 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 reading like 250, 270 pages. I was like, wow. And I, I knew this was going to be for life. So, and 
Yeah, it, if you guys didn't read it so far, you're losing it for sure. You're losing a uh, lifetime, you're losing a lot of stuff, you know, losing health, losing money, you're losing a lot of stuff. So if you didn't buy, bought your copy yet, if you didn't read it for sure, go for it. So uh, how, how long have you been a raw fooder? Uh, you just said it, right? 45 years. Yeah, but, but it's hard to... It's hard to know because I didn't do it the way people do it today where they knew that raw food was a thing. I started including more raw food back in the 70s. Um, and it, and sometimes it was intentional and sometimes it really wasn't even that intentional. Uh, I hadn't ever heard of a raw diet. That, that I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, and then by, by early eighties, I'm eating fruit for breakfast and fruit for lunch and, and, and realizing like I'm eating and a salad every night. There was never a night that didn't include a salad. Um, and I'm meeting people who are using a phrase that, that is still common in some parts of the world, but not so much called high raw. And the high raw diet meant that they were eating a lot of raw food and they were happy about that. And I was doing that uh, for a good long while. But it was obvious to me that that wasn't, it wasn't logical. It didn't make sense. Um, yes, I could be okay with it. Um, it didn't have to be a religious conviction. Uh, it didn't have to be all or none um, in the same way that I will still fly in an airplane. I don't have to be, you know, my feet firmly on the ground. I don't have to be in a rural setting every day. I can go into a city and breathe city air, but it's not as, it's not as nice. It's not as health constructive as being out in the, in a rural environment where all you see is is green and open view and you don't see any buildings necessarily you just see nature forms a lot of curvilinear rather than rectilinear and um, and we can make little exceptions and still be healthy but the food thing at some point i just go i really need to be eating all raw or at least trying to eat all raw and so that took that probably was i don't know eight or nine, maybe almost 10 years before I got to that point where I go, I got to eat all raw. And then once I did that, it took me, it took me another seven years to figure out how to do it. Where I would go all raw and I'd be all raw for a couple of weeks. And next thing you know, I'm craving corn or potatoes or pasta it was always carbohydrates it was always complex carbs but it had to happen over and over and over before i go you know what the answer to this problem is eat more simple carbs you won't create it seems obvious now and then finally um there was no exact date it wasn't like you where you said i read the book i made the transition this was much more, oh, when I look back on it, I see that this happened, but it wasn't really guided. And I didn't know it was a thing. I didn't know I was doing something that was going to become a lifestyle. I didn't know I was doing something that I was going to coach others in. I was just doing something for me because it made sense. Let me find out what's going to happen if I eat more fruits and vegetables. Like every health teacher I've had since I was a little boy from an apple a day keeps the doctor away to eat more fruit. It's really good for you to, you've got to eat your veggies. You don't get dessert unless you eat your veggies on and on and on through, um, through, through my grammar school and my high school and my college training and over and over taking nutrition courses, learning how all the vegetables and all the fruits have all the vitamins and all the minerals and, 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 and other things have nutrients in them too, but there's nothing else that has it all. There's nothing else that provides the full package. 
that fruits and vegetables provide. And so, and even then, it just, so now I can look back and I go, yeah, well, 40 years. I mean, I've been doing raw food for 40 years, but I was heading that way for a decade before. And I don't take, I'm not, I don't know. All, all I know is it's enough bananas. So if I lined them up end to end, it would get me to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> One time I figured that out. <laughs> you probably ate what? 60 <sighs> tons of fruits and vegetables for these 40 years, maybe more, 70, 80 tons. Maybe a hundred uh, tons of fruits and vegetables. It's, the, the thing it's, is, yeah. it, because I have a head start, I can still tell you, even you, with 13 years, right? Uh, 17 years. 17. You've been going at 17 years. And I can still tell you, well, I've eaten a lot more fruits and veg than you ever have. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe more, fruits, maybe more fruits and vegetables than anybody alive. But who cares? Oh, I, oh, I just want to feel good today. I, I, I want to eat stuff that's self-constructive today. I want to have self-constructive behavior. Uh, you use the word like it's bad for you or this or, you know, I, I don't even think of that. I'm thinking, is it self-constructive? Is it self-destructive? And, and I want to do self-constructive things. I know I do. I, I want to continue to grow. I want to raise my awareness. I want to remain useful. Uh, I want to be valuable. I want people to come to me who need help, and I want to be able to help them rather than me needing help. I'm not ready to be the guy who needs help. I'm I'm still wanting to be the person who provides help, and that's that's very meaningful to me. That's important to me to be that person. Uh, so far, that's still happening. I'm glad I was invited to. The six major fruit festivals this year, I'm the lead at all six. And that's not a brag. That's, I'm very honored, you know. Um, but but you, as I say, you, it's, you important, it. you, it's important. It's important. your reality. It's important to be able to be of service. It's important to me to be valuable, to be able to give. And so I love every part of that. You have to be proud. You you created that. If it wasn't by you, there wasn't been that those six festivals or even more than that throughout the world. So it's not it's not something you know. You should you, you should be proud. You you deserve it. Then tell me, how does a person wanting to become a raw fooder? What would be the first steps for them to you know proceed? Because you said something that was quite right, and I, I agree. Even in my time, when I read your book and I had your whole model, it was still just you without YouTube, you know, like nowadays it's much more easier for people seeing, there's a lot of people talking about it, you know, that there's more information, there's more access to like Instagram, it's, it's easier. But even then, tell me your main tips for somebody that wants to start. Well... Really, it's eat more fruit. It's get used to the idea of eating more fruit. Uh, there's going to be more volume in whole, fresh, ripe, or organic plants than there ever was in any refined food. So you're going to have to reset your idea of how much is enough volume. You got to eat uh, substantially. You got to eat enough to hold your weight. And and on food that is, doesn't have the caloric density of refined food, it means you got to take more bites. You've got to be attuned to the cravings that come about. And if you're craving starchy food, you're not eating enough fruit. If you're craving sweets, you're not eating enough fruit. Uh, if, you're craving, if you're craving something after meals, you're looking around for dessert. You didn't eat enough fruit at the start of that meal uh, or the fruit wasn't sweet enough. And, and if... If you're looking for something heavy after a meal, you want to, you're eating a bag of nuts, you know, just trying to stay full. Uh, that's again telling you, you just didn't eat enough fruit. 
there's only five cravings, right? The last one is salt. And if you're craving salt, you're not eating enough vegetables. Uh, this is without considering all the emotional things that can lead to all sorts of... I'm not becoming a psychoanalyst tonight. We're just looking at this physiologically. But those are the five cravings. You're either craving starch, you're craving something heavy, you're craving sweets in between meals, or you're craving sweets after meals. Uh, and in all those instances, you're just not eating enough fruit. And every time it happens to you, that will be a learning experience that eventually tells you you need to eat more fruit. Uh, if it happens to you during the day, you go, wow, I had breakfast and then I'm hungry again an hour later. You didn't eat enough fruit. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It'd be like having one bite of breakfast and then going, when hung an hour later, I was hungry. Well, of course, because you didn't eat enough. So learning to eat enough to hold yourself from meal to meal uh, is becomes the first thing. The second thing becomes learning to deal with having that much fruit in and around your house to comfortably juggle that much fruit without having fruit going bad and fruit that you completely forgot about for a month and then science projects in your fridge or in your closet. Uh, these, are, these are basic mechanical things that have to happen, right? You learn and and then eventually, if you catch on and you get interested, you can start to learn the names of things uh, and, and, and refer to fruit by their botanical names or refer to fruit by their variety name. Like we do with some things, you know, most people name apples by the variety. Oh, they know a gala apple is different than, you know, some, a conquered apple or whatever. And, and we know it with grapes, too. We tend to know variety names with grapes sometimes. But a lot of people say, oh, the red ones. And I go, no. <laughs> if we're going to become the fruit experts, but that's a little more advanced fruit expert that starts to become conscious of varietal names. But the beginning is eat more fruit. The beginning is eat more volume. The beginning is be aware of the cravings that come from insufficient fruit consumption, uh, insufficient vegetable consumption. Do you need to learn recipes? Well, you can if you want to, but you don't have to. Lots of people, lots of people don't even make anything. They just eat fruit as is. Like we breathe air, drink water. You don't have to flavor your water every time or flavor your air or color your air. You just breathe it. And a lot of people do that with food, but some of us like to play with food. I enjoy making things for my family. I enjoy making vegetables easy to eat and delicious by creating salad, um, you know, a little bit of work with a food processor, a little bit of work with a knife, a little bit of work with a blender. Next thing you know, you've got something that's very easy. It took me longer to make it than it'll take them to eat it, but that's half the fun, right? That's just showing love for your family. Um, I don't think I need to make this a so, complicated thing. I don't think, oh, what's the first thing you got to do? You already said, go read 80, 10, 10. Uh, but I don't think we need to make this a complicated thing, really. We can. I know how to make it complicated. I teach a course called Culinary Skills, and it takes me 13 days to teach that course now. And, and people can learn all the culinary skills and they can make raw food. I mean, they can make raw food for an audience that's not raw and the audience would never know. I mean, they're, they're French fried. My French fried onion rings are as good as anybody else's French fried onion rings. We just didn't fry them. <laughs> I've been there. So I think it's actually pretty easy, Eduardo. And that to make it more complicated, um, maybe it serves the coaches, but it doesn't serve the students. Eat more fruit. Exactly, exactly. And what about the other parts of hygiene? I learned one, one thing with you that I tell all my patients and I think was, 
I learned many things with you, right? Like most of the things uh, back then. Nowadays, I read a lot of science, but I still see you as a, uh, my biggest teacher. And what you said really resonates to me. And even more nowadays, after studying a little bit more of chronobiology and chrononutrition, starting to really be strict with light during nights, with foods uh, stopping when the, the sun goes down. And now I, I feel more than ever the word that you, the, the phrase that you always use, your health is as good as its weakest link. And most people don't realize that it's like, you know, a lot of people that follow my, my content on, online, they come to me just understanding the diet. And they are ready with an excellent diet compared to most people, but they don't exercise as much. They think like walking two to three times in a week is enough, sleeping like seven hours a night is enough. And, you know, so what you, would you talk a little bit more about it? Well, I mean, I think you summed it up nicely. Your health is, is can't, it can't be better than your weakest link, right? If you're holding hands with seven people and say, let's go for a walk, you can't go faster than the slowest person. So your health, your overall health can't be better than whatever the weak link is. And if that weak link takes you down, you go down. All the strong links don't really matter. Lots and lots and lots of super fit people die of heart attacks because their cardiovascular health wasn't good, even though they were super fit or all the other ways. So you told me that. So we, so we really uh, want to once in a while do an assessment and, and look at, you know, are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting enough rest? Are you building your emotional poise? Are you building your self-esteem? Uh, how do you talk to yourself? Are you getting fresh air and sunshine on a regular basis? Do you sleep with windows open or windows closed? That's a big thing big point, you know, a lot of time in your day that you, you can be breathing your own air or you can be breathing fresh air. Uh, and all the other things, are you surrounded with nature sounds? Do you interact with animals ever? Uh, there's a lot of parts to... I, w I was at a festival recently. I was, had the good fortune of being at a festival recently. And I'm teaching a fitness class for 36 people. It was a treat. And at the end of class, I just stood in the doorway and said, anybody who wants a hug, you know, hug me on the way out. And I got 36 hugs in a row. And, and, and that kind of appreciation from 36 people to touch chest and give a hug and support and, and say, I appreciate you and, and hear that come back to you. Oh, I appreciate you too. Um, that's as important a part of your health as what are we eating for breakfast i mean if you want to if you want to really destroy somebody isolate them that's what prisons do if they want to absolutely destroy somebody they isolate them uh, if a society wants to punish somebody they shun them you know, uh, there's really not anything worse you could do. So, so I know one of my mentors uh, used to, I don't know if he's still fond of saying, but certainly he used to be very fond of saying, you can't even be psychologically normal if you're not getting a dozen hugs a day. Like, you need to be contacting with people. This whole isolation thing has gone too far. <laughs> so to me all the links add up and yeah you can you can spend a little more here or spend a little less there or have a little shortfall once in a while and make up for it but I mean if you're trying to raise a, a the best African violet you know you and a bunch of friends having a contest who can raise the best African violet well, the winner is going to be the person who provided the best conditions the most of the time. And it's the same for people. If you want to be your best, you provide as close to ideal conditions, substances, forces, influences, conditions. They're all different. Uh, 
as much of the time as possible. And every time you let yourself down, we take our own responsibility for that, for letting ourself down. When you start to beat yourself up with your own words, like, what's that about? You, that's not a healthy thing to do, to beat yourself up with your own words. You don't see any infant doing that. You don't see any child doing that. Youngsters, really young. They don't beat themselves up trying to learn how to walk and then say, oh, you're so stupid, you'll never learn how to walk. They don't talk to themselves like that. Um, we need to be self-constructive in all ways. Always, always. So we need to be doing it always, and we need to be doing it in always. In any way that we are not self-constructive, then we're being self-destructive. And why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> I still don't get it, but they do. <laughs> no. After all these years trying to understand, it's like, you know, they find any capable reasoning i don't know like i don't know how to, i don't know how to explain it you know whether it's ignorance is bliss or whether they know something we don't know maybe we're the silly ones but i don't think so <laughs> i don't think so i think that you know they're coming to they're coming to us for help eventually i think so, it's more uh, emotional than rational right there used to be a there used to be a, an old tv commercial that i think they advertised mufflers or something for cars and and they said you know we'll get you now or we'll get you later and that's kind of how i've always felt with hygiene is like the people who tell me i'm nuts now and then 20 years later they're coming to me for help saying i you know i tried all those other ways they didn't really work i need to do it your way can you explain it to me now so it's i there's a there's an old saying that you can you can lead a horse to water, but you can't hold their head under till they get thirsty. You know, my mom used to say you could lead a horse to water, but you can't make them think. <laughs> and I don't know what other people think. I'm not thinking for other people. Uh, I'm here to help people who want my help. I'm thrilled to be able to offer help, uh, whether that's coaching or helping motivated people become better at what they do which is my favorite thing is performance coaching uh, but no matter what it is i mean i'm uh, it's actually becoming now a big part of my business is is becoming osteoporosis coaching and helping people overcome osteoporosis because just changing your diet won't do it so it's a little more complicated than that and, and I like I like a challenge. I had to actually uh, live that experience with my dad when he was dying of cancer in his last days, like in his last weeks, he asked me for help. But he, yeah. he didn't do everything that I said. But even then, after in the last three or four days of his life, he, he already had metastatic cancer in like four organs. Uh, and he, he fasted naturally, right? He didn't yeah. even need my advice in that. He was not hungry at, at all. And he said in the, his last days, you were right, I want to become a frugivore. And it's sad for me because I always remember that, but, you know, we can't make the horse drink the water unless he wants no. to, he, unless he understands that. And, and, it, and in many ways, it might be the hardest the part of... In many ways, it might be the hardest part of your entire hygiene journey is watching your loved ones yeah. not choose to come with you. They don't choose to come with you. They don't choose to come with you, but you're responsible for your path. And you you can't be responsible for anybody else. You, they come in alone. They go out alone. They got to make their own decisions along the way. I remember Shelton say, uh, saying, uh, uh, quotes, I cannot eat for you, I cannot exercise for you, I cannot sleep for you, I cannot uh, emotional poise for you or something like that. I cannot, you know, be m uh, mentally poised. So, yeah, it's like that. I can only teach you the right ways of living. So, last, any last words, Doug, for motivation of everybody that's listening to us? 
I think that that being healthy is insanely easy. And being sick is terribly, terribly difficult. Uh, there's a price to pay either way. But to me, the price that I have to pay in order to be healthy is more like a prize. I get to eat fruit, sweet and juicy, all day long. I get to have enough sleep. I get to see beautiful things in nature. Um, I continue growing. I feel good all the time. Uh, to me, these are prizes. This isn't a price. And, and I encourage people, if they're not actively doing so, to make improvements in their lifestyle, to go to health. You know, uh, a lot of people said things to me in the past. Unfortunately, my hearing um, allowed me to hear something other than what they said. So what I heard was, go to health. And I don't know what they were really saying, but some of them didn't like my message. And, and, and that's okay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people to go to health. I'm going to tell people to raise their expectations and to to up their health and eduardo i'll tell you the same up yours too um you know it's it's eat more fruit folks it's very very simple and very very rewarding what this guy folks at home what this guy motivated me and taught me like almost two decades ago was more worth than a billion dollars were more worth than anything on the planet. I know it's hard to understand. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's blah, 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 but there's no, nothing better than being healthy and to be able to help others. Because my mom, for example, she's not a frugivore, but she's like 80% fruits and vegetables. She's like really lean. And I, I, you end up, she never read my books. She didn't read your book, but just by seeing her son fasting and living this way, she, uh, like all my, all my closest relatives, they ended up getting a lot of, you know, the, the person that works with me in video here, you know, he c came here ordering all like cheeseburgers every day when he came to live here. And now he's like eating primarily fruits and vegetables, not even cooking that much food. So, uh, we're all, we're all influencing others, folks. We're all influencing others. People are looking for answers to their health problems. And, and let's take that responsibility very seriously of influencing people for the better. Doug, first of all, I, I have to thank you, but not just for the interview today, but for being who you are. It's hard for us to go out against the grain, literally, <laughs> but it's a must that one day we will be recognized. So congratulations for being Thank who you, you are Thank you very, very and much. for changing my life, changing the life of so many people and maybe even changing the world itself. Like your work, Shelton's work was only advancing things that we're still not giving the, same, the credit that we should, but hygiene maybe one day, if the world understands it uh, soon enough, we will actually be the, the greatest uh, discovery, the greatest breakthrough of all time, of all human history. So thank you for today. Thank you for, the, uh, for changing my life also, for giving me a new life. And also hope to see you in, in UK and hope to be with you more in, yeah, in person. Yeah, that be great. Hope to record with you in person. And I also hope to win you on, on tennis because yeah, I didn't win me. You'll whoop anything me. last time in football. <laughs> what? You'll whoop me. I'm sure you'll whoop me. You'll run me around. Yeah, because he, last time in Health and Fitness Week, he won me again in everything. So I have to beat him in something at least. So maybe <laughs> in tennis, in... I, I, I will win. <laughs> Although it's unfair because I'm practicing for a year. <laughs> Whatever it See takes. See you guys. Bless you. Up your health. 10.